Welcome back to another fantastic session at Human Leaders. This week, we are diving into resilience. And we have with us today one of Australia's leading researchers in this field, Yuri Russo, who's also the CEO of Driven. Um, their team does some fantastic research in this space within the six domains of resilience. Um, and they run some fantastic programs in preventative resilience. So really helping us as individuals and as organizations be proactive around how we develop ourselves in a very robust way. So as I mentioned, we have in the last two weeks really been looking at burnout and really looking at how burnout is an issue both for leadership and organizations to really get a handle on in terms of how we mitigate this, how we look at, you know, job design and organizational factors that contribute to that. And my hope is that by diving into resilience today with Yuri in a very pre preventative and a proactive way, we can really add some more tools to our tool belt in how we help ourselves as human beings and as leaders and as organizations, you know, develop teams that are resilient. And as Yuri and the team so eloquently de um, define resilience, they talk about it in terms of advancing despite adversity, which I really, really love. I think this takes away this idea that we need to become resilient to bounce back from something but in fact we can continually build ourselves up in a way that helps us continue to advance and face things with adaptability and flexibility as they come. So I'm going to introduce you to Yuri now who is obviously a resilience expert and the founder of Driven which is a research and technology organization focus on understanding and building human resilience. So through this Yuri continues to create innovative and accredited resilience programs, including the AI-powered Driven Resilience Program, the groundbreaking Resilience First Aid Program as a proactive mental health approach, and the High Adversity Resilience Training, which is called HEART, which is actually used by emergency responders. So these programs have been used by various universities, defense, government organizations, and therapists worldwide. So Yuri himself is a member of the International Association of Clinical Neuropsychotherapy, holding a Bachelor of Commerce and a Certificate in Medical Neuroscience. So through 20 years of experience in research into resilience, Yuri has published various research papers on neuroscience of resilience, including the predictive six-factor resilience scale, which is used by various universities, organizations, and therapists as a key model to understand and measure resilience. So this forms the basis of the National Resilience Index Report, which Yuri publishes, monitoring the national resilience of Australia as a nation. So Yuri's also written a book called Executive Resilience, which delves into the neuroscience of cultural resilience and how resilience will become more important as a skill to thrive in a digital environment. So Yuri's goal is to build resilience in as many people as possible, aiming for a 25% improvement in resilience by 2025 a goal that can significantly reduce mental illness through a practical and measurable proactive approach. So Yuri has been featured on TV and various magazines as a resilience expert, and he's continuously working to create a more resilient future. So without further said, welcome Yuri. We are so, so, so grateful and so delighted that you have joined us today. And I will officially pass over for you to guide us through the session. Fantastic. Thanks, Lex. It's great to be here with everyone and good to see some familiar people like Trina over there as well. Uh, so, Sienna, it's really good because I, I want to actually talk about a couple of numbers that change the way that I think about resilience. And this kind of comes from, you know, having researched resilience for a long time. And originally what started me across this whole journey was me wanting to work on my own resilience and kind of the, all the stuff that I went through as a teenager and all that, which I thought, man, yeah, you know, I, it would be, would have been great if I knew a bit more about how to manage my own mindset. And then I went into this whole world of research is working on myself initially. And as I was doing that, then I started to get more of these concepts together that really helped me. But then I thought, man, this stuff could really help other people as well. And that's where eventually after about you know, 10 or so years of research for myself and then starting to work in industry as well, starting to, uh, to work with organizations and people and seeing how can we build resilience in others, then 
all of this started to uh, come together into Driven as a as a, uh, an organization, just really researching resilience and building tools around it. But uh, but even after all of that, then when we recently published the National Resilience Index, there were a couple of numbers that came out of that, just that just kind of really refined the ideas for me quite a bit and kind of changed how I thought about resilience overall. And so I want to share a little bit of that. And I've got a bit of a presentation over here that I'll run through just to kind of help illustrate some of these numbers. So I'll uh, just pop in a share over here and I'll uh, just open up the comments there too, if anyone wants to ask anything as we move along. But uh, hopefully you can all see that okay. And yeah, so. I want to talk first a little bit to so the National Resilience Index. So this was an interesting report that uh, we published towards the end of last year. And really what this was about was more of a curiosity about, you know, what, what happened in Australia. And we also looked at the U.S. as well in terms of the national resilience levels over the, the COVID period. And, you know, starting from just before COVID you know, kicked off, to you know, quarter by quarter basis, you know, how did the how did the nations respond, and what are what are the lessons that we can learn from that? So, uh, so the report is free to download it's on our website, talodriven.com, if anybody wants to have a look at it. But I'll, I'll share just a couple of the highlights here and some of the things that just really stood out for me. And just to kind of set the scene, so this is at a at a high level what we saw in terms of Australia's resilience, where. We started off you know, around uh, 69%, and this is measured on the predictive six-factor resilience scale. So it's a zero to 100% scale of measuring resilience levels. And that's, of course, the average-ish level that we saw at the nation at the time. Then there were, and this is in 2019, around quarter three, where the bushfires happened. There already we saw a big dip down in national resilience levels. So we started to recover a little bit, but that's when COVID initially came out and that pushed things down, like the overall national resilience scores down to, you know, especially when, once the social distancing kind of started. There were lockdowns a little bit. And uh, in Australia, these weren't necessarily as harsh because at this level, there still weren't a lot of cases in Australia compared to the rest of the world. Uh, but still, we saw a pretty big impact in those national resilience levels. Then, you know, states started to open up again towards quarter four in 2020. Uh, but then when Delta came around, then it was kind of like the rug being pulled out of everyone and everyone just went, Ugh, not again. And that's when we saw this really big dip down. Uh, and uh, But then, you know, the vaccines and all those things kind of came around and it went up. What's happened since Omicron's come out? We haven't looked at those yet. So to be, uh, you know, keep a lookout for the next report because that'll be interesting to see how we went through that. But through all of this, it was interesting to see the, the ups and downs that people experience in terms of their resilience. But then we were interested in just how, how does resilience relate to mental illness as well? Because, you know, that's one of the big things we saw through COVID is that depression, anxiety, things like that really took off. Uh, and, and there was a lot more impact and a lot more uh, incidents of that. So that's where we took a lot of the data that we have because we have a lot of PR6 resilience assessments where we also measured uh, depression and anxiety symptoms. So we have those, those data sets and we could combine them to then plot out what does it look like? How does resilience relate to mental illness? And where, you know, where does resilience really start to protect ourselves? So that's where we got a couple of interesting charts. So this one here, we can see uh, symptoms of depression going uh, upwards there versus uh, resilience. And what we can see is a very clear trend, of course, is that as resilience increase, then depression symptoms decrease, which kind of makes sense, right? If you know, more resilient people you know, less likely to, uh, to experience depression. Uh, very similar for anxiety here as well, where we see you know, as a resilience increase, then symptoms of anxiety decrease as well. Now, there's a couple of interesting things in this chart that really stood out. So in one of them, like if we kind of overlay these here, is that we can see uh, there is 
there's actually quite a lot of variation in between you know, an area like this, where you know someone with resilience level over there, you know, someone might actually be over there and might be doing great, but someone might also be over there and might actually be really struggling, even though they've got exactly the same resilience level. And this, this is really important because, and it brings me to the first big number here, which is 70%. 70% is the, the average level of resilience. And that's kind of the, the benchmark rates that we established when we did our initial validations of the PR6 assessment. So most people score around 70%, which means that someone could be there and then they go through something like COVID and they end up up there and they're actually really struggling. So, and getting back down you know, to actually manage that might be really difficult. So really what this means for us is that an average level of resilience of 70% does not actually protect us. And this, this started to make a lot more sense to me because this is one of the things that I've seen you know, so many times when I talk to people. Because when you, when you ask people, are you resilient? Most people would say, yeah. But really, most people are in that 70% range, which means they think they're resilient, but they don't actually have that depth of skills and they don't, haven't actually really practiced it to the extent that they are protected against these Know, these bigger events that can happen and even the small things that happen on a daily basis those kind of things eat away at us and that's exactly the same same type of thing with burnout as well where there are these little things that happen over time that start to weigh on us and start to move us towards that that sense of okay things are just becoming too much and we burn out so that's where we come to the second big number which is 85 percent so this is an incredibly important number because this is really what we see when we look at this chart again. When we get to around 85% resilience or higher, that is when we see, you know, some person might be over there, they go through something like COVID and they go up to there. And yeah, they're, you know, it's it's not fun what they might be dealing with, but they're actually still doing well. That's the big difference. Like when we go into that 85% plus zone, that is when someone actually becomes protected. That is, it, it's almost the range that we can say that if you're in there, you are resilient. And if you're not on that range, then you have resilience, but there is more that you can learn to become actually really resilient. So that started to make a lot more sense to me in terms of you know what I've been seeing, where you know so many people feel that they you know, they they think they are resilient because it's you know they've been through stuff, and you know we've all been through stuff, but not all of us have really dealt with it in such a, a healthy way and such a constructive way that we actually feel great about you know all these kind of things that that we go through. So that is also why I think. There is such an important aspect in terms of prevention because we are only really, you know, we're generally in terms of mental health, we only really focus on the treatment side. You know, we, we look over there and we see, hey, these people are struggling. Let's give them treatment. And because, you know, they've developed depression, developed anxiety, something like that. Uh, so it's kind of like that area over there. And we don't really pay attention to all these people over here who have little bits of vulnerabilities, you know, they've got little things that, that makes them more likely to potentially develop mental illness if something happens, uh, or even, you know, just life happens and, you know, they, they feel like they're not really going anywhere and eventually they just kind of move towards, you know, my life doesn't really have any meaning. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what I'm doing. And they just kind of move towards a, a, a feeling of depression, for example. That is really the, the whole zone of prevention there, because if we can do more at that level, if we can teach more to people at that stage, hey, here are the things that you can do to move towards this 85% plus zone where you become protected, then we can stop this kind of eventual shift that happens to some people going into the mental illness side. Because, you know, as the stats usually goes, you know, 25% of people in you know, one in four or so will develop some kind of mental illness over time. 
I don't think that's an acceptable statistic. And I don't think that's something that we, we should just accept is something that can happen. I think what we really need to do is to focus on that, those, that big portion of people who don't necessarily have that high level of resilience to protect themselves. And if we can build their resilience to make them truly resilient, then we can start to shift that, uh, that trend and start to reduce those numbers of people that might eventually uh, develop mental illness down the track. So that's where the, the next question, of course, comes in, which is, you know, how many people are actually in this range and how many people are in the different ranges? So luckily we've got numbers there so we can explore and that there we see this distribution where only about 9.2% of people are actually in that protected range. Vast majority are you know, kind of besides the, the average, and surprise, surprise, that's kind of what the average means. <laughs> and then, of course, around 16% of people are in the, the lower range where they're seeing a much higher risk of, uh, of mental illness. So that, I think, is so important to recognize because that basically brings us to the, the other really important number here, which is really what that means is nine in 10 people can benefit from learning more about resilience. Nine in 10 people can benefit from building more of those skills, especially at a more proactive level, you know, doing this in a preventative way. Because if we can get people to start to understand that, hey, these are the things that I can do to be resilient. These are the skills that I can learn and I can work on these things. And as I do that, I start to protect myself. Then that is when we can really shift the needle and we can actually start to shift those those global trends that we see in terms of how many people develop some kind of mental illness down the track. So I think that's, that, and that just really kind of changed how I think about resilience overall, because it's just having that understanding that, hey, here is an actual level where it is protected, where we become protected and it's 85% plus, which means it's really understanding resilience at a deeper level. And we have practiced those skills that is really what we are aiming for and what we want to get people towards. Now, before I go into the next part, any questions so far? Any thoughts that jump out? Not seeing any questions come through, Yuri, but just reflecting as you were speaking then, and, mm. and um, I wondered if you could, um, and I'm sure you'll probably cover this as we continue going, but is there, um, you know, in my experience, a lot of people tend to think of resilience as being perhaps associated with things just like grit, like resilience is mm. just soldiering on. And I noticed as you were speaking, you mentioned, you know, we've all been through things and sometimes how we get through them isn't always necessarily the healthiest way, yes. but we, we got through them and therefore we deem ourselves um, resilient. And that was just something that struck me as well as, oh, I, I would have raised my hand to saying, yes, I'm resilient, but perhaps there's, you know, more to the whole mm. picture there as well. Exactly. Yeah. No, that is, that is indeed the very next slide. <laughs> awesome. Let's dive good, in. Good foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Love, love this outcome and research. So how could, or would you recommend other countries, i.e. Canada, using this research and integrating, transforming, applying it into their country current situation. Mm. Yeah, and it's, it is interesting because a lot of the, the research that we have, or the, love, the numbers that we have kind of all, are all over the world and it's very similar trends uh, that we see elsewhere. And I think a lot of this is about creating awareness that you know, this is something that we, we need to look at these levels because it's, it's, it's not really limited to any kind of country because it's really just humans that we're talking about here. And having people understand that, that concept that hey, actually there is more to resilience, there are more skills that we can learn. And uh, I'll go into the PR6 model next to, to explain a bit more about what that actually looks like because I think that's really important is that there is a specific model with specific skills that we can focus on. And if we build those skills, that is what actually moves us to that protected range. And the skills themselves, I, mean, I think a lot of them are 
things that you know we can teach in all kinds of different ways so for example we're looking at how can we bring this training and this curriculum into school so that uh, the teachers can learn it the kids can learn it the parents can learn it as well and we can start to build resilience in a societal level at a, at a much earlier age but then of course organizations as well having more of that awareness about this is this is where we should be having something like the PR6 that they can assess and they can see this is where we actually are as an organization. Here are we are. So this is where we're at across all the domains. Let's work on the domains that, um, that can get us towards more of that protected range. So, so in all kinds of different situations, whether it's organizations or communities or schools, the, the model is something that we can apply and use it to to start creating awareness about resilience to start to build those skills in uh, in different types of ways so, and of course if you can get into the government in some kind of ways and get grants and lobby and all those kind of things would be great <laughs> yeah that's interesting you mentioned that though yuri because it's something that comes up regularly within our group here is how we actually um try and push for some of these bigger changes um and obviously mm being that a lot of the practitioners we have in this space are from a HR background, how we actually perhaps look at changing um, HR laws around how, how we, how we make this commonplace in organizations. So um, that's uh, it doesn't always seem like such a far off dream, but we'll let you keep going for now. Cause I'm sure yeah. everyone's very excited to hear more about these six um, dim dimensions of resilience. Yeah. I'll, I'll mention something about that quickly and then I'll just give Ricardo a chance quickly to uh, ask as well. But, um, but yeah, one of the things that, I think is the big challenge for something like resilience and that's something that we're trying to do something about is to make it more clear how that links to mental illness. Uh, so in, like the resilience first aid program that I'll talk about. So we are getting that accredited as a suicide prevention program as well, because I think that it's, that's often one of the biggest problems from a policy perspective is the lack of clarity in terms of what preventative thing can actually lead to a good outcome, which is you know, always why the, the treatment side of things and the crisis management side of things, that always gets funding because it's clear like, hey, there's a crisis here, we need to fund it to do something. But when it's prevention, then it's often like, eh, and what's actually gonna do anything? So, and that's where if we can get more of that data together, if we can paint more of that picture that, hey, this thing, this preventative approach actually has real results, then I think that makes, starts to make it easier to uh, create those kind of policy and, and broader changes. Uh, Ricardo. Thank you, Yuri. Um, I, was, I was intrigued at the, uh, the chart that you had of the overlay there, um, you know, with the percentages. And it seemed to me what I found interesting is that the rate of improvement, yes, um, up the rate of improvement up to 70% seems very, you know, very slight. The slope mm. is very small all through. Yeah. And then there's a huge increase in terms of the rate of improvement mm. once you hit that 70% mark. And, and so my question is, when working in organizations where you tend to have the program du jour kind of you know, uh, mindset and you've got a lot of resistance in terms of changing behaviors, are the needed interventions differentiated? Um, because for people that are below the 70% level, it seems to be a much more extensive intervention than people that you know, are assessed and have a rating above 70%. And in the work world, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm curious about your experience and the advice and the consulting you've yeah. done, what you have seen in the organizational environment and whether the solutions have to truly be differentiated yes. to have an organizational impact that will be sustained over time. Yes, absolutely. And this is... It's a good question because it's one of the big reasons for why I created the program in the first place. And this is me coming from the corporate world where I've seen so many of these programs just fail miserably because of you know, there's not a comprehensive enough approach in terms of getting engagement and getting it in different 
ways and different levels so that people actually use it and stick to it for behavioral change to actually happen. So a good example of what we're doing is like with the fire services over here, where we are coming in at a whole bunch of different levels to be able to create a culture of resilience. And this includes training for the leadership. There's you know, training for managers. There are internal trainers being set up so that they can provide you know, actual workshops within the organization itself. There are champions they were training with resilience first aid so that there are people on the ground you know, actually talking to each other. There are physical materials we're including as well. And uh, all, you know things like like stress balls with the, the six domains on them, stuff like that. You know things lying around and like the fridge magnets that I have up there with you know a whole bunch of different resilient skills on them. Stuff that creates conversation, and then also like the resilience app that we provide to people, to the members themselves, the firefighters, and so on. And also providing that training to the family members at home, so that it's this really comprehensive culture that, that we start to build and we reach people in all kinds of different ways because, you know, it's quite right, like different people would require different interaction to actually, you know, take notice of this and to realize that, okay, yeah, maybe I will pay attention to this. Some people are just in it straight away and they go, hey, cool, yeah, this is awesome. But there's always going to be a lot of people that are resistant in different ways from those who feel like, oh, I'm just too busy, I don't have time, or those that feel like, ah, I'm not interested, I don't need this. And we need different approaches to be able to reach them, create interest, uh, and like doing assessments, that's often a good one to get people aware of, and then they realize that actually I'm over here and I should be over here. So that is where it is very much this kind of coming together of different methods and, and an integrated methodology across each, these different mediums from relational to physical to digital so that we can achieve this culture that can sustain and that can draw people in over time. So yeah, really important question because that is, that, that is ultimately the big challenge. How do we actually create change in the real world <laughs> where uh, we've got a lot of different opinions? <laughs> cool. So that is where I'd like to talk a little bit about the six domains here. Now, this is the big model that we created uh, and uh, that I first published the research on. And the, and the real reason why I published the research on this, because initially when I created all this stuff, I wanted to use someone else's model. But then as I started looking at all the validated models, I couldn't find one that had everything that I thought was, was important, especially the health domain. That was the one domain that was left out of all of the other resilience research models that, that I found. Uh, so previously, basically, resilience was really looked at as a mental thing and physical doesn't really have anything to do with it. But we've got so much research now, especially from the neuroscience aspect, about how exercise and sleeping and nutrition support neural adaptation and it's, it supports uh, neuroplasticity and growth and in so many different ways creates a good environment for the brain to be able to thrive and to, to learn and adapt and change and to enable all of the other domains. So once I published the model that I basically done the validation to show the linkages between these different domains, that's when a whole bunch of universities and other people started to get in touch because they had the same idea. They just didn't want to do the research themselves, apparently. So they were just looking for, for someone to do the model and <laughs> get, it, get it out there. But, uh, but yeah, then... From this, then we started to build the whole program around it in terms of what are these skills across the different domains. Now, I'll just mention the domains themselves quickly. So vision is about our sense of purpose and meaning in life. This is also, incidentally, the domain that we see as being the most important uh, from the data. When people have that sense of meaning and purpose, that's when it's, it's almost like it provides guidance to all of the other domains. Like, what are you going to do with these with the skills across the other domains you're going to move towards something that is important to you that is you know one of the big driving forces for us as people uh, so then there's composure which is the more the emotional management stress management side of things this is really that ability to down regulate the limbic brain and to enable us to be open and to use a whole brain response for uh, whatever situation we are. So it's, it's a very in the moment type of skill that we can build. Reasoning is more around 
uh, the, the cognitive skills like resourcefulness, prevention, planning, really more the, the forward looking type of things um, and, uh, and using those cognitive skills to be able to adapt to different situations. Then there's health, of course, nutrition, sleep, exercise, looking after yourself physically, doing that consistently. Tenacity is often kind of what we think of in terms of grit, you know, those type of, you know, just being persistent, uh, bouncing back from mistakes, things like that. But here we can see it is, it's one part of resilience. It's something that fits in with all the other skills that enable true deeper resilience. And then of course, collaboration, which is all, all about relationships, social confidence, connecting with people, having those meaningful relationships. So very important part of this because resilience is not just about ourselves, it's about how we connect to people around us as well and how we support their resilience, they also support ours. And it fits back into you know giving us a sense of meaning because a lot of our meaning is connected to people as well so and that's when they all kind of start to connect to each other and it's this whole uh, amazing like interconnected nature of all the different resilience domains so the nice thing about this is that it gives us a strength-based model to be able to understand that hey these are the things that i should work on i can build all of these different skills none of us are born great in any of these some of us start to practice these skills unknowingly without even realizing at an early age like some of us are just kind of more social and we have a good social interaction as a kid and then we do more of that because it was fun and we build those uh those social skills you know without really realizing we're practicing well someone else might not and it takes more conscious effort to to build those social skills so that is what's interesting is because we can measure these, you know, where are we at? And then start to look at, okay, cool, let me build these. And as I build them, that's when we start to move towards that 85% protected area where, you know, we actually start to gain protection against mental illness over time. So, so I really like this in terms of just for myself as well. And having done research in this for a long time, I still go through the app and things like that, where I go through these these skills again and remind myself because it's the kind of stuff that you know we forget about over time and we get so busy with stuff that you know we do kind of need to come back to it and uh, and keep reminding us and keep practicing these things so that we stay in that zone where we actually feel protected over time um so there's a couple of comments so i'll just have a quick look there uh, jen was saying so glad you noticed that we have such compartmental ways of understanding mind body and we need a model like this to attend to the whole person and the nervous system as well. Yes, exactly. So that mental mind-body relationship. Cool. Biosocial, biopsychosocial, spiritual interconnectedness. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, trust is an integral part of mental health. Wouldn't you? want trust to stand on its own trust is essentially between people so we kind of put that into that um, uh, that broader domain of collaboration and that's where i suppose the the clarification on the domains as well is that they are broad domains of skills and behaviors that we might show uh, whereas yeah, it, it's it's easy to kind of start to split out a whole bunch of things but this gives us a, a nice overall conceptualization that we can assess against and then understand where all these different types of behaviors fit in. Yeah. Cool. So I'll talk just a little bit about the kind of things that we do here, just to give you a bit of a background on some of the stuff that, uh, that we're helping to, to create some change around this. And, uh, and this is stuff that you can have a look at as well, if you're interested, but one of them is the, the driven resilience app. So this is just a way that we use to, to teach people the, well, basically take them through the assessment first so they can understand where are they at as individuals. And then from there, start to work through the short daily activities. Because this is one of the big things that we found in the neuroscience as well, is that breaking up the training into smaller parts that creates more neural change over time. That's basically that idea of micro tasks. How can we get people to really absorb these bits of training? so that you know it actually results in change that uh, that's meaningful and measurable over time and that's one of the challenges that i found in uh in a lot of seminars and workshops as well where of course 
it's it's often you know all we have available is that chance to you know spend a day with people and throw a ton of resilience and well-being information at them but most of that kind of washes over people and by the end of the day maybe there's a couple of things that they remember and two weeks later a lot of people forgot that they even went to the workshop and uh and there's you know, very little actual change that happens so this for me as well was a way of how can we make it more practical to get training out to people and to reinforce those concepts over time so that there is meaningful change so so that's for us is one of the concepts that we use uh, when we work with an organization like the fire services for example we mentioned before where it's here's Here's a way we can provide training over time, but also scale it up as well so that it becomes cost-effective for organizations like to be able to reach people. And, uh, and then and this is kind of also one of the usual interesting things that uh, if you can include it in any of the training that you provide uh, is uh, adding some humor into it as well. So we have a, a chat bot that people can, uh, can talk to. And as they talk to it, it does incorporate a bit of humor as well. And so you can kind of define your own path as you go through to make it a bit more interactive. Janice is asking if the app is free. There is a, a free component of it where you can do some of the training uh, for free. Like there's, for example, a job seeker resilience course, which uh, is a free component of it. Uh, but then there's some other premium stuff in there as well. So you, so you can download it for free and check it out and play around with it. And, uh, and then there is a premium component to it as well, if you want to go further. But, um, but the other big one that, and this is one of the big things that we've noticed over the last couple of years, is how many people are in a position to be able to support others, especially when we look at uh, a lot of the stuff that happened over COVID, uh, a lot of the suffering that people notice in others as well. And then if we also think back to that chart of nine out of 10 people are in that range where they can really benefit from learning more about resilience, how can we become champions to be able to start teaching other people, hey, this is the stuff you can do. These are, uh, here are ways that you can build resilience and here are some interesting things that I learned. So that is where the Resilience First Aid course come out, came out as a response to what we really saw in people and that desire for people to help it is a certification course. It's a two-day course that teaches people in a lot more detail how to understand and how to use those six domains of resilience in a way so that you can support people around you, teaches them language so that you know, they can understand how to have that those conversations and uh, and also teaches them like the basic risk factors and things to look for as well, how to notice when someone is struggling, how do you respond to that? But a lot of it is really focusing on the preventative side. How can we be more proactive? How can we build these relationships, not when someone is depressed, but ideally way before so that they never become depressed in the first place? I think that's ultimately, you know, the, the bigger goal here is that we want to build a happy and connected society where we all feel that, yeah, we're cared for, we're looked after, and we can create those relationships. So it's been really interesting running this training and of just the last three days have just been in full day workshop delivery mode, just talking about this nonstop. Um, but we've had some really interesting people that came through it. A lot of parents do this to learn language, to talk to their kids better. And, and uh, just yesterday we had someone that came back and uh, and talked about how they use the the conversational protocol that we teach in resilience first aid to talk to their uh, their kid about uh, the, something that the the kid was working on and they had such a different response in terms of uh, her child feeling like oh you're actually interested in what I'm doing and uh, and this had had such a much more of a positive experience just by changing the language a bit using these kind of concepts. We've got a lot of teachers that um, that are working through this and uh, are now looking, as I mentioned before, how do we build this stuff into the school curriculum, get these you know, these concepts over to kids in a lot earlier, and uh, and then of course a lot of organizations, uh, just like for managers, how can they use this as a way to change how they interact with their staff? Because of course a lot of it, a lot of burnout, for example, is from the interactions that we almost inadvertently you know, have with people, the kind of pressures that we 
put on people that we might not necessarily realize. So building that awareness so we can change our language, change how we interact with people, how do we connect, and how can we do it in a way that really supports each other. So there is a, a workshop on this coming up on the, uh, when was it again, the 25th of March, if anyone's interested in joining that really interesting uh, program. So we get fantastic feedback on it, and we've got a whole bunch of physical resources that come along with that as well. Um, but uh, but yes, it's been a been a good bit of a, a labor of love to to get this program up and running as something that uh, just really increases people's ability to connect better with each other and support each other. Um, but that's kind of the, the presentation that I had, so I'll, I'll stop that that share over there before I just keep talking for too long. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, I see there was some another comment from Morgan there. Uh, what kind of patterns do you see when looking at the six areas? Do the tools help the areas most frequently needing prevention uh, or are those most difficult to address? Yeah, interesting question. Actually, in the 2019 research paper that we published, uh, we saw very interestingly and all, almost kind of opposite what, to what I expected. I kind of expected that when people use this stuff, the people who are most interested in well-being and all that would be the biggest users uh, of these uh, of these materials, but actually, the people with the biggest need ended up being the ones that spent the most time actually engaging with this and actually learning from it. And it really started with the assessment. When people do the assessment and they see, hey, and I'm strong in reasoning, but composure is actually pretty low. It's that personal benchmark in a way that I think drives people's interest to then say okay, maybe I should do something about this. And, uh, and that's when we see, yeah, people actually take an interest in what can really help them. So, so yeah, interesting question. I'll actually just post the link to our research page for anyone that might want to uh, download the, the research papers. Cool. Now Gary, I have a bit. question around the dimensions and, um, you know, as someone who's led a team before mm. it's, it's, you know, different people obviously have different things going on. Do you find that within the research, if someone has a lower level of resilience, it's like kind of across the board in those dimensions, or can they perhaps be someone who's high in tenacity, but lacks vision or lacks the, the health to support them to bring it up to that level? Is it, mm. is there any trends with that kind of, um, in the domains at all? Not really. And that's what's really interesting is that we see so much variation mm -hmm. where some people are just off the charts with this and just really struggling with that. And even because we've measured a whole lot of different teams and organizations as well, and the teams themselves also vary a lot, which is always really interesting when it's like on a team level, you know, they all kind of struggle a little bit with this and they're all kind of high in that. And, uh, and that's often when we present those results to teams and people go like, oh, yeah, I thought I was the only one that felt that way. But it's, it's actually, you know, most of us. And then they start talking and, you know, and start to connect more about those kind of ideas. So, yeah, no real trends about which really just relate to each other. People vary a lot, which is really interesting. That is fascinating. And what's fascinating with that, Yuri, and I, I'm not sure if you have any kind of deeper understanding around this but speculatively with those teams when you mentioned to you I, it sounded like you mentioned that certain teams tend to trend so that perhaps they mm. um you know a lot of people score similarly around say tenacity or something like that perhaps you know on an organizational cultural level that's mm. because there may be some things that are placed at a higher um, priority mm. than others within those teams would you say that that might be the case and perhaps that's an eye-opener for the leader of the team to say oh actually we, we need to be yeah. focusing on the health of the team or focusing on the collaboration of the team and things like that yeah and it's and it's often a really useful tool for for a manager to be able to see what's happening because the it's it's very possible that it could be the, the managerial style and the leadership style that is influencing the team in a certain kind of way. And, uh, and we've seen, for example, some of the, um, some of the teams that, that have gone through that and they saw that, you know, composure is actually something that uh, they all kind of struggle with. And then they print out one of the charts of that, like with the emotion maps and they put that on the meeting rooms and things like that. So it becomes something that's more visible and they, they talk about more often and they be, become more conscious about it so that there is some kind of collective action that, that goes in to then start to change the, the management style and the communication style. 
And, uh, and yeah, so it's those kind of tools that I think it just make us more aware of ourselves. What might we be doing that's in influencing other people and, uh, and seeing yeah, how, how can we change together? And then, of course, measure over time and see, you know, are we making a difference or do we need to do something else? <laughs> Yeah, agreed. And with that, Yuri, because again, as, as someone who's managed a team, you know, there's obviously um, your influence plays heavily into the culture. But have you at all um, compared resilience scores against different personality types, like are, are extroverts, introverts? Like, d is that at all a factor that of consideration we need to be aware of as a leader? Like certain people are maybe more prone to need support in certain areas mm. or, or things like that? Yeah. Do you want to get controversial? because <laughs> i have <laughs> that was really interesting which is um some things like uh like introversion and extroversion mm -hmm. uh, and this is something we've we've seen uh, on on different levels is that um like introversion tends to have lower levels of resilience and as resilience go up uh, so and there's kind of two different relationships here because when and we've seen this where people specifically worked on resilience and as the resilience increase they actually become more extroverted mm. right so perhaps you know, it's there's more there's... of a comfortability that comes about with that though. yeah yeah exactly fascinating because it's, it's that type of thing so there's quite a quite a few of those kind of things that we've seen where even things like um uh you know dutifulness and you know, um people's you know orderliness and those type of things are all which are also personality factors also tend to increase when resilience increase so so it's and, and yeah and it comes back to those type of things of uh of like pride and uh and self-care and things like that that we might be doing more of as well especially when at the higher levels of resilience where we tend to also be more consistent in looking after ourselves so there's there's some different relationships in there, which I know kind of goes against a lot of what we like to think is like, man, all personalities are fine, but actually some personality types are quite a bit more resilient than others. Yeah, and I think, um, again, from a leadership perspective, it's an important consideration because I think it gives us context into how we can support certain staff. Mm. And obviously, um, you know, talking around something like collaboration and teamwork. And the reason I asked the introversion extroversion question is because obviously um, it sounds to me like for the individual, there may be an element of self-awareness and maybe EQ required to sort of help understand where we might need to dive a little deeper and in the mm -hmm. ways in which we'll feel comfortable in, in developing our own resilience given our own personal context as well. Do you find that mm -hmm. that's like a, a factor within that? Yeah. And and even talking from my own personal experience, uh, which is of course very anecdotal, but uh, as I worked on my own resilience, I be I went from being very introverted to be very extroverted. So it's mm -hmm. kind of a and and a lot of that for me as well was that level of comfort and level of safety that I have with other people because I feel a lot more centered, a lot more safe myself. So I'm a lot more open to be around whoever and just have random conversations with people. Mm -hmm. So it's so it is yeah, and then kind of fitting those kind of ideas into a leadership style as well in terms of EQ, as you mentioned, creating that safety for people probably then also ends up bringing people out of their own shells and uh, creates an environment within which they can thrive and they can be open and, and interact and engage. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I, I appreciate why it's controversial. Obviously, there's a lot of management literature around, you know, yeah, no. <laughs> personality traits and Jen's mentioned it here as well. And I think, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of literature around how we, we can, you know, do the, the self-development needed to kind of help mm -hmm. ourselves comfortable in situations that are maybe um, less naturally comfortable to us. So I appreciate you answering that question. Um, mm, yeah. in, in, that's where I just look at the data and see yeah. what that says. And then I go, what does that mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now I'll go back to a few of the questions. Ricardo's asked, I know he's based in the States. Um, was, there, was there a significant difference in the findings between those two countries at all? Or are there any um, key factors that were different between those two countries in the findings? Yeah, the US elections. When the oh, elections wow. happened, the U.S. just went. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I was uh, that was kind of interesting. But um, you should you should download the report. There is a chart of uh, of that in the in the National Resilience Index. 
Fantastic. And Morgan has asked a question here. Did the comfort and confidence come from these tools? And I guess that perhaps comes back more to um, maybe your own journey, Yuri, and that as well. Did you find that some of these tools were helpful in that shift from coming from a place of introversion to um, sort of finding your comfortability in some of those, I guess, more social probably settings and et cetera? Yeah, because there are quite a few different things that uh, of the domains that come into it. For example, like vision, where you become more clear in terms of mm. what your own life is about, what your goals are. Uh, a lot of that kind of philosophical questioning we can do with ourselves in terms of figuring out like what's really important in life and in the world. The more we go through that, the more confident you become in your own path in life and the the, almost the less worried we are about other people questioning ourselves and, and all that because we've already done a whole lot of questioning a whole lot of thinking so it's a lot easier to just talk with people without being without feeling threatened in a way and then of course the composure skills as well just that ability to kind of calm your mind regardless of the situation that you're in then that also helps you know within those situations to feel like yeah i i can be calm i can handle whatever situation i find myself in and thereby also enhancing that, that sense of being it almost increases your curiosity about, about wanting to put yourself into more challenging situations where and, and to kind of see you know how far have i come as a person in a way yeah absolutely and i can see trina's raised her hand so i'm going to invite yeah. her on to um ask your question jump on trina yeah, you 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 just you just triggered something that just kind of when you're reflecting on your past experiences and where are you now, it's almost like what is that mantra or that self talk you tell yourself, right? Like, and, and it, for me personally, it's like when something's happened and it could be a conflict or trauma or something little or big, right? But it's what is that first self talk mantra that I tell myself that I can get through, and 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 that that for me it was um. I could, what was it? It was like, no regrets. I can get through it. No regrets or akuna matata. No worries, right? That's just what I tell myself. And it could be like something like recently, the latest one was a gas leak in my house, right? Mm. Here I am talking to the guy going, akuna matata, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's what you tell yourself because you've gotten through other stuff before. So it's that, that mantra, that self-talk of what's that first thing you go to right away that will help support yourself. That's just what it made me think when mm. you said self-reflection. Yeah, for, for me, it's usually that curiosity about how am I going to solve this? Because I, and I know I'm going to solve it. So it's that curiosity. It's almost like watching a TV show, like if your favorite character, where it's in like, you know, let's say you're watching a house or something, because it's, it's always like a house is always going to figure it out. So, it's, yeah. so it, you're mainly watching for the curiosity, but how is going to figure it out? So it's kind of for me, like watching my life as a TV show, almost like with a popcorn <laughs> with some problem that I'm coming up and me watching myself yeah. like, oh, I'm curious to see how I'm going to do this. <laughs> awesome. That's really interesting, Yuri. And I wonder, does that sort of um, detachment from being in the problem as being an observer of the problem, is that kind mm -hmm. of one of the school, the one of the key skills that we're learning through something like this resilience program, like that sort of observational versus being part of everything? Um, yeah, so it's just a bit on the reasoning side where there is a visualization skill, which is, and this is a bit of a different type of visualization compared to what people would normally think of. Normally people would think of visualization as you think of something going great and, you know, how are you going to get there? But this is, this is negative visualization, which is almost mm. like a, a bit of a stoic kind of skill where you're visualizing something going wrong. Then you imagine what the impact of that will be if it's got a big impact then okay let's think about that what is the impact about mm. how what can we do about this can we prevent this in some way can we minimize it in some way can we take some action in advance or can i accept that outcome in advance so that if it does happen then i'm, I'm, I'm more prepared to it so it's kind of removing yourself from that but then when stuff happens then you already have a bit of that skill of removing yourself and and observing well now this thing is happening how are you how are you dealing with it and that's the kind of stuff that um that you know i've i've talked to people for a long time and there was a, a very specific difficult example that i that i usually gave to people about that and then that actually happened to me and i was kind of then then it was a bit like that and it was kind of me watching myself like oh now this big thing has happened to you. How are you dealing? <laughs> How are you going to deal with it? Can you do what you said you would? And then I found that actually those things that I talked about were really useful. 
and uh, and even though it was something that it was kind of traumatic in a in a way, it. It, I still had the skills to deal with it and, and I could observe myself going through that process and, and dealing with it in a, in a way that um, felt very natural and very healthy and, uh, and actually worked well. So, so yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah, that, that's very cool. I love that. And I know there is um, some research around, you know, the visualization process in, in terms of goal attainment and things like that as well, and, and kind of preempting barriers. And I think maybe there's even a component of that realistic expectations, which I think was part of that model as well as yeah. kind of understanding, um, or at least mitigating, you know, what's, what's a realistic outcome here, because I think we can sometimes become grandiose in, in sometimes our, our visions. And when there's none of that checking yeah. mechanism, we can become disenchanted and disheartened very, very easily through that process as well. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I see very Jen's cool. coming along to the training. She is cool. very exciting. And guys, I'm just conscious and um, we've had Yuri's um, attention now for an hour. Does anyone have any questions um, or other comments that they would like to make? just um, before we wrap up the session at all this evening or this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Does anyone want to jump on and share an insight? Um, you're welcome to raise your hand and I'll unmute you and you can jump on and um, share with us. Trina says, amazing. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Trina. Much appreciated. Does anyone have anything at all? Very cool. I just, well, um, I'm just going to share that Yuri and Alexis, that, uh, yeah, I, of course, I posted something on LinkedIn to highlight both the, the research and the leadership, because this was awesome. And, and we need to get the word and share the word, right? Because this mm -hmm. is what's going to help, help prevent intergenerational trauma by creating yeah. intergenerational resiliency. Mm. Yeah, very important, yeah. given that, resilience is something that can translate on an epigenetic level as well so yeah agreed and you know obviously human leaders we look at everything more from an organizational and leadership context but the real crux of human leaders is that we're humans first and we're leaders mm. second so by preventatively proactively developing our resilience at an individual level you know we both create that capacity in ourselves, but we can compassionately open that capacity for others like our team to do the same. And I think that yeah. looking at us in a proactive way, you know, creating that space for this change to occur. And as we've spoken about in our burnout um, sessions as well, proactivity, you know, from a business sense, obviously saves money, which is great for the triple bottom line and all these fantastic things when we talk about attrition rates and productivity, but on a human on a human level, we're at like the forefront of a revolution in changing the way we work here. And I think programs like Yuri's and, and this proactive resilience is an empowering step in helping us truly make change in how we do business because we can, when we develop this in ourselves, we again create the space and open the opportunity for this to filter into the our organizational cultures as well. So Yuri, thank you so, so much for joining us today and sharing this incredible research um with us i do have links to the national um resilience index um which i will pop in human leaders yuri shared the link here as well um again that was the 25th of march yuri for your resilience first aid program that's correct yep correct yes great and how can people access um to sign up for that one so if you go to hellodriven.com there is a little shop button and, uh, and you can basically find the course in there. It's the, the blended delivery of the training. So it'd be amazing to see some people there. So, yeah, awesome. I can see Chris furiously scribbling notes. Don't worry, Chris, I will get that link to you as well. Um, it'd be fantastic to see some of our community um, in that session. And um, obviously a big part of human leaders is challenging ourselves to grow and evolve and, and supporting mm -hmm. one another to do the same. So. If we get some community members at that session, I would love for us to come back as a group and learn from some of your learnings and mm. have that community challenge connect. Let's discuss this. Let's share our learnings, our insights. As Yuri's mentioned, different personality types take to this differently. We all need contextually different work and different support to develop ourselves in resilience. And we, we have a beautiful community where we can share those insights and help each other learn through and with one another as well as so I'd love to see us um, show up for this program and then we can come back and convene and learn through each other's learnings as well. 